Hello uh, and welcome to this Taylor Wessing webinar in which we are going to explore the detail of the important UK Supreme Court decision in Warner Lambert against activists and Milan. Uh, Supreme Court decisions about patent law are relatively rare and this one which was handed down by the court on the 14th of November concerns a number of issues. Uh, the two most important issues which we are going to focus on today are the direct infringement of Swiss form second medical use patent claims and secondly the role of plausibility in assessing validity on the grounds of insufficiency. If you have uh, any questions while, while we're talking uh, please use the Q&A box on the browser. Uh, if we don't have time to answer your questions during the webinar we will definitely follow up afterwards and, and, and attempt to answer your questions. So the development of new therapeutic applications for known drugs has, of course, been a desirable goal for a long time, particularly when the development of entirely new classes of drugs is often said to be increasingly difficult and expensive. One way in which research into new uses for existing drugs can be encouraged is the exclusivity offered by second medical use patents. Aside, however, from the difficulties that have been encountered in the past about how to draft second medical use claims, uh, avoiding the exclusion um, in patent law for claims to methods of treatment, uh, these patents also raise an issue of enforcement, which is this. When, the, when patent protection of an underlying active ingredient has expired, how can a second medical use patentee prevent a generic version of the drug being used for the patented indication, either deliberately or accidentally. Conversely, how does a generic company supply the drug for the legitimate, unpatented use with the confidence that it will not be used for the infringing use? This issue has been difficult to solve, and as a consequence, it's required the case of Warner Lambert to go all the way to the Supreme Court. Swiss form claims also raise issues of policy. How much information about the claimed therapeutic use should be disclosed and to what, and to what level of proof must it be shown to work? To deal with this issue, the UK courts and the boards of appeal of the EPO have developed the requirement of plausibility. Previously, aspects of this concept have been dealt with by the highest court in the UK in the context of obviousness and industrial applicability. This time it is, it is raised in the context of insufficiency and focuses on the important question of how high the plausibility threshold in English patent law is for a second medical use claim. My name is Matthew Royal and to discuss these issues today uh, I'm joined by our senior professional support lawyer Paul England. I'm also pleased to bring in our colleagues Judith Krenz, a partner in Amsterdam, and Gisbert Hohagen, a partner in Munich, to give us the benefit of some perspective on how second medical use infringement is approached in their respective jurisdictions. Let's start by turning to the basic facts of the Warner Lambert case. Uh, to describe this, I'm going to hand over to Paul. Well, thank you very much, Matt. <clears throat> the, uh, well, the case ultimately stems from Actavis's marketing of a generic pregabalin product under the brand name Lascent or Lecont, if you like, which was launched in February 2015. Lascent is marketed under a skinny label, which means that some possible indications are carved out of the summary of product characteristics, the SMPC of the product. In this case, the SMPC and the patient information leaflet included in the packet um, state that the conditions for which Lascent is indicated uh, epilepsy and generalized anxiety disorder only, indications for which patent protection has expired. However, Warner Lambert owns a patent for which the relevant claims here uh, are one and three, and these are in the Swiss form, that is, the use of X in the preparation of a medicament for treating Y. And the claims claim, one, use of S3 amino methyl 5 methyl hexanoic acid, which is to say pregabalin, or a pharmaceutically acceptable salt thereof, 
for the preparation of a pharmaceutical composition for treating pain. And then claim three, use according to claim one, wherein the pain is neuropathic pain. Now, Actavis, together with Mylan, claimed the revocation of the Warner-Lambert patent, and despite the treatment of pain being carved out on the skinny label, Warner-Lambert claimed against Actavis for infringement of claims one and three. At first instance, Arnold J. held that none of the claims of the patent were obvious, but the claims one and three, as well as some other claims, were invalid on the ground of insufficiency. In particular, that the claims were not plausible across their scope. The judge also held that if claims one and three were valid, Actavis's activity with Lassant would not infringe those claims either directly or indirectly. The Court of Appeal dismissed appeals to this decision by both parties, upholding the first instance decision. That decision was then appealed to the Supreme Court, which heard the case in February 2018. By the time the case reached the Supreme Court, the issues left to resolve were the test for infringement of a second medical use claim in the Swiss form, and the test for insufficiency based on lack of plausibility, in particular with regards to Claim 3. Now, given the complexity of this case, I think it's worth setting out the results in summary just at the outset so that we know where our discussion is generally heading. And note in particular that this case was heard by a panel of five Supreme Court justices who may disagree with each other in their decisions and their reasoning. As it happens, on infringement, all the judges decided that Lesson would not infringe the patent if held valid, which incidentally also means that the reasoning in this decision on infringement is only obiter. Those reasons by which they hold non-infringement are, however, split two to one, according to the judges, around whether the test should be one of subjective intention of the manufacturer, that was Lords, Briggs and Hodge, or whether it is the outward presentation of the product emerging from the manufacturing process that matters. That was Lord Sumption and Reed, and to a a much qualified extent, Lord Mance. Lord Mance is the one judge in the 221. On plausibility, Lord Sumption, giving the leading judgment for the whole court, upholds the lower court's decisions that the patent did not plausibly support the treatment of central neuropathic pain. He also leads the majority in holding that the patent did not plausibly support any kind of neuropathic pain, thereby allowing Mylan and Actavis's cross-appeal. The claims alleged to be infringed were therefore invalid. The Supreme Court also agreed with the first instance judge that there was no indirect infringement and that seeking amendment of the claims after trial was an abuse of process. Although I'm afraid to say, given the time constraints today, we don't propose to go into these latter two issues here. What we will look at first, though, is the issue of direct infringement. Now, before going into the reasoning of the Supreme Court on direct infringement, a short note first of all on prescribing practice in England and Wales, which is relevant to this. Article 11 of Directive 2001-83 permits the generic applicant for an abridged marketing authorisation under Article 10 of the same directive to exclude from the SMPC for their product any indications patented by another party. This is the skinny labelling that I already referred to. As regards prescribing practice in England and Wales, a doctor will usually identify a drug on the prescription using its international non-proprietary name, its INN. And when a prescription is written generically, the pharmacist is free to dispense a branded drug or a generic one. So in this situation, the doctor doesn't know which will be dispensed. Furthermore, only a small percentage of prescriptions identify the condition being treated. And so pharmacists don't usually know the indication for which the drug they're dispensing has been prescribed. As a result, a skinny label in itself may be ineffective in preventing generic drug being used 
for a patented indication. And the implications for this for marketing of the generic drug were therefore a key issue for the Supreme Court to uh, deal with. So the starting point for the judges in Warner Lambert was to actually construe what the patent claimed. In particular, what was the meaning of neuropathic pain in claim three of the patents? On this, the Supreme Court unanimously agreed with both Arnold J and the Court of Appeal. It should be broadly construed to cover central neuropathic pain and peripheral neuropathic pain. And I shall define a little later um, what those terms mean. As regards the correct statutory provision, English law recognises Swiss form claims as a form of process claim uh, because they're to the preparation of a medicament. So there's no dispute that the relevant section of the Patents Act 1977 is 60 uh, paragraph 1 subparagraph C. This says that where the invention is a process, a person without consent is prohibited from acts including the disposal of, offer to dispose of, use or import of any product obtained directly by means of that process. The issue before the Supreme Court was not what this section meant, however, but instead what was meant by the word for in a Swiss form claim and what, if any, mental element it requires of the manufacturer. So at first instance, Arnold J held that the word for requires a subjective intention on the part of the manufacturer. The Court of Appeal disagreed and held that the word for requires the third party manufacturer to know or be able to reasonably foresee the ultimate intentional use for the infringing purpose by an end user. And that's an objective test. The Court of Appeal also added a defence for the manufacturer that would apply when all reasonable steps have been taken to prevent the generic product being used to treat the patented indication. However, giving their judgment on this issue, as I already summarised, while two of the judges thought the word for did import a subjective intention, all the judges agreed that the foreseeability test was inappropriate. Furthermore, two judges... Lord Sumption and Reed put forward a new approach, which they called the Outward Presentation Test. To explain why, I'm going to hand back to Matt. Thanks, Paul. <coughs> yes, um, so all the judges rejected the objective foreseeab foreseeability test favoured by the Court of Appeal. Uh, Lord Sumption and Reed give detailed reasons for this. Um, or well, I should say Lord Sumption gives detailed reasons for this and Lord Reed agrees. Um, they begin by stating that foreseeability is a way of attributing legal responsibility to the person who should have foreseen the objectionable consequences of their acts, whether or not they actually did so. But when attributing legal responsibility to someone else, such as a pharmacist, it is entirely arbitrary. Another difficulty is that some more than de minimis leakage of generic pregabalin into the market for treating neuropathic pain is foreseeable, whatever reasonable steps are taken. So according to the simple foreseeability test, this means that all stocks of generic pregabalin will be manu manufactured by uh, use of the patented process because it will be foreseeable. And any subsequent dealing with those stocks by importers, distributors or pharmacists will constitute an infringement. This, uh, the court held, is an unjustified de facto extension of the expired patent for the original compound. The defence set out by the Court of Appeal was also rejected, uh, and this was on the basis that it was not the function of the courts to invent non-statutory defences to statutory torts when Parliament has not provided one. So moving uh, on to subjective intention. Uh, this was also rejected by Lord Sumption, again with whom Lord Rhee agreed, uh, for reasons including the following. First, Lord Sumption noted that a patent is supposed to define exhaustively what the product or process is that is protected. 
for the scope of the monopoly to be dependent on the unascertainable state of mind of the manufacturer is not consistent with this. Secondly, if subjective intention is relevant, they say, then liability under Section 61C can extend to a person by virtue not of their own intentions, but of the intention of someone else, namely the generic manufacturer. Thirdly, subjective intention implies choice. In other words, the manufacturer of the generic product must intend use for the patented patent-protected purpose downstream. But this is actually outside the manufacturer's control. They can only have a hope that it would be used for this use rather than an intention. Fourthly, there are practical problems of applying a test based on subjective intention. Lord Sumption gives the example that the generic manufacturer makes pregabalin, intending it to be used for the treatment of pain, but that this doesn't happen. Does the mere intention therefore take the entire production run, even if it is, even if it is all used for conditions such as epilepsy, where the patent protection has expired? Lord's Sumption and Reed conclude that no rational scheme of law could depend on these considerations. So what are the foreseeability uh, and subjective intention to be replaced with? Instead of subjective intent, uh, the subjective test and objective forward slash foreseeability test, Lord Sumption instead proposes an outward presentation test. This is intended to roughly paraphrase the German Sinfelige Herrichtung, uh, apologies to Gisbert and any Germans listening for the pronunciation, um, but this is the major test of infringement in Germany. According to the outward presentation test, the badge of purpose is the physical characteristics of the product as it emerges from the relevant process. This will identify the treatment for which the product is intended and includes its formulation and dosage, package, packaging and labelling, which includes skinny labelling, and the patient information leaflet. In the judge's view, this has several advantages, uh, and these include, uh, first, it is objective uh, and not dependent on proof of the internal mindset of the manufacturer. Secondly, in a purpose-limited claim, the designated purpose is an inherent characteristic of the invention. The outward presentation test is consistent with, the, with this notion, and a test based on intention is not. Thirdly, the outward presentation test properly reflects the critical feature of Swiss form patents, namely that the patent is for the process of manufacture and not for subsequent use that may be made of the product. The physical presentation of the product is generally part of the process of manufacture and so achieves this. Fourthly, it provides legal certainty, in particular for those downstream of the manufacturer who deal in the product. Um, fifthly, and critically in Lord Sumption's view, it strikes a fair balance between the public interest in rewarding the invention by allowing the patentee to exploit his monopoly and the public interest in the free use of the invention for therapeutic uses which do not have or no longer have patent protection. Nevertheless, as Lord Sumption admits, it is not a completely perfect test. There could be circumstances in which the labelling and the patient information leaflet of a generic manufacturer might be regarded as a charade. The example used in court was a generic company supplying much more than the non-patented market uh, was worth, particularly if that part of the market was small. If this was a real problem, however, Lord Sumption said that the legislature would need to address it. So what did the other three judges decide? Uh, so giving a minority judgment, uh, Lord Mance agrees that the correct infringement test in the circumstances of this case should depend on the objective appearance and characteristics of the product as it is prepared, presented and put on the market. But recognising the problem of the charade cases, he leaves open the possibility that Firstly, in rare cases, the context may make it obvious that appearances are not to be taken at face value. And secondly, that there may be circumstances in which the generic manufacturer should positively exclude use for the patented, patent protected purpose 
on the label. This leaves Lords Hodge and Briggs. Uh, these two judges preferred the view of uh, Mr. Justice Arnold, that the test is whether the alleged infringer subjectively intended to target the patent protected market. Explaining this conclusion, Lord Briggs states a number of reasons, including first, uh, the purpose limitation in a Swiss form claim necessarily involves a mental element. When someone speaks of making something for a particular use and conclude that for means something more than suitable for, it must point to something in the mind of the manufacturer. However, the judge emphasizes that this doesn't mean presentation to the market will often, or indeed usually, be the decisive evidence, one way or the other, of the manufacturer's intended purpose. The second point made is that it is not safe to conclude that the UK jurisdiction can simply follow the German Simpeliger Herrichtung model. In particular, the Supreme Court knew nothing about the particular features of the German systems for prescribing and dispensing medicines. Uh, it knew nothing about its regime for patent infringement or about the market conditions within which a fair balance has to be struck. Furthermore, the outward presentation test would not strike a fair balance. For example, a generic manufacturer might demonstrate the requisite purpose by flooding the market for pre beyond the non-patented indication, the so-called charade that um, Lord Sumption uh, had in mind, or by covertly encouraging dealers and pharmacists to, to use it for the treatment of pain, regardless of what appears on the label, or a smoking gun internal document might reveal the manufacturer's packaging for the non-patent use was just a charade. These forms of evidence might prove the requis requisite intent, even if the packaging did not. Lord Briggs also has reservations, however. In particular, he recognises the concern that Section 61C, in conjunction with Swiss form patents, imposes draconian strict liability on dealers in generic products, without giving them the ability to find out whether the manufacturer has an intention that taints the products in their hands. In its favour, the subjective intent test would, the judge thinks, allow for all forensic evidential means to establish whether a manufacturer is seeking to serve and profit from the patent protected market. This could include, but not be limited to the packaging on the product, but extend to targeted disclosure during litigation of documentary records of the manufacturer's decision making processes. As I note, uh, the Supreme Court makes a number of references to the German approach to infringement in their decision. So uh, I think now we're going to hear a little more from our colleague in Munich, Gisbert Hohagen, uh, and also take the opportunity to hear from Judith Krenz about how this issue is addressed uh, in their jurisdictions. So oh, thank you very much, Matt. Um, First of all, let's have a look uh, what constitutes direct infringement of a second medical use claim in uh, Germany. So uh, first of all, uh, of course, it is the use of the uh, substance or product for the patented purpose. However, as this um, usually occurs in the private sphere, which is exempted from the legal effects of the patent, this is of no interest for the patentee at all. Therefore, the German Federal Supreme Court shifted the effects of the second medical use patent forward to the commercial sphere of the purposeful arrangement. We, we translate this with purposeful arrangements, sinnfällige Herrichtung of the substance or product in Germany for the protected use. And thirdly, the offering for sale or putting on the market of the purposefully arranged substance or product in Germany. But the important question is what has to be understood by purposeful arrangement? Um, even in the German language, this is an unusual wording. And normally in patent litigation, we spend much time on determining what is sinnfällige Herrichtung. So a purposeful arrangement can be achieved by a particular formulation and composition of the substance or product that is predestined for the patent protected use, or which is more important, the enclosure of a packet leaflet that encourages the buyer towards the patented use, or by any other means 
which are directly linked to the product. So there is no purposeful arrangement and hence no direct patent infringement if the specific intention to be used for the patented purpose is not directly linked to the product but could only be derived from general marketing materials, for example, flyers or statements of salespersons. Thus, according to these principles, there is typically no direct infringement by a generic manufacturer as second medical use, the patent protected second medical use usually is not mentioned in the package leaflet, which is skinny labeling. So there is no purposeful arrangement of the substance for the patent protected use. And according to this principle, direct infringement by generics may only lie in particular composition of a substance. In uh, June 2016, there was a forced first important step um, of the German Federal Supreme Court in its Pametrix Hick decision. In this decision, the Supreme Court broadens the scope of protection of Swiss type claims in Germany. They are now treated as product claims, which means that Swiss type claims under EPC. Um, 1973 are subject to the same rules as second medical use claims under EPC 2000. As according to the German Federal Supreme Court, it is a specific property of the substance that they protect, which is all also inherent in the finished drug. Accordingly, for indirect infringement of Swiss type claims, it is not necessary anymore that a substance is offered and supplied to purposefully arrange the substance for the patent protected medical use in Germany. It is rather sufficient that the substance is offered or supplied for immediate use if it is obvious that the product will be used in a patent infringing way. So as a result, Swiss type claims may be indirectly infringed where the substance is delivered for direct administration. Now, the interesting question arises whether direct patent infringement of a second medical use claim without purposeful arrangement is conceivable. Dr. Kuhn, the presiding judge of the Düsseldorf Court of Appeals, who is quite famous in Germany and well known to be very skeptical, very, very skeptical towards generics, says yes. Direct infringement without purposeful arrangement of the product is possible if the product is suitable for the patented purpose and the supplier of the product takes advantage of circumstances which ensure that the purpose related to your product use of the preparation offered or sold actually takes place. According to Dr. Kuhnen, this requires a sufficient and not just occasional use of the product according to the patent in suit, as well as the supplier's respective knowledge, or at least its bad faith ignorance thereof. The most, ex ex uh, most important example is, of course, cross-label use. So the generic supplier of the product can be liable for patent infringement if he knows or should have known the prescription and substitution practice in Germany, which is favorable uh, to, for him, and takes advantage of this practice, nevertheless, by supplying wholesalers with the product. But what are the consequences of this recent case law of the Düsseldorf Court of Appeal? Please note, there is no confirmation of the German Federal Supreme Court. It is only the Düsseldorf Court of Appeal. But as you may know, um, this is an important court in Germany, which is very patent owner friendly. So there's a, an increasing risk of liability for direct patent infringement of second medical use claims for generics. And according to this new case law, skinny labeling is not sufficient anymore to prevent liability for direct patent infringement. However, the Düsseldorf Court of Appeals leave open which measures may be expected from generic suppliers to prevent liability. Are these information letters to pharmacists and physicians or patent warning notices on the packaging 
which um, which is quite difficult uh, from a regulatory um, uh, law perspective or quantitative sales limits in order to ensure that the product is used only for the non-patented indications. So there's much room um, for the creativity of generics lawyers in Germany. But now I'm very curious about the Dutch approach and therefore may hand over to my colleague Judith Krenz. Thank you, Gisper. Um I will indeed touch upon um, the Dutch approach here um, for this um, uh, second medical use infringement. Um, well, I can say already that uh, the Dutch approach is uh, much more aligned um, with the German approach than um, with the English approach. Um, in the Netherlands, we have had two Supreme Court uh, judgments on second medical use um, infringement. Uh, both have been rendered in 2017. Um, it concerns the Sun Novartis case and the MSD uh, Teva case. Um, both cases um, related to um, second medical use claims, uh, they were infringed or they were alleged to be infringed and the judge had to decide um, whether or not there was um, infringement. Um, contrary to what the um, UK Supreme Court ruled in those cases is that Swiss type claims which are of course process claims and EPC 2000 claims, purpose limited uh, product claims are um, to be treated in the same way. So they should have, should give the patentee the same um, scope of protection. About infringement, the Dutch courts are following uh, the foreseeability or objective test, and that is the test um, Matt just told us about uh, in more detail um, also, uh, which was also uh, raised in, in the UK and was explicitly rejected uh, there. However, our Supreme Court so far has accepted this foreseeability test and ruled that if the generic foresees or could reasonably foresee that um, his product will be used for the still patented use, he will infringe the patent rights. There is, however, an escape by the alleged infringer. He has to show that he has taken all reasonable steps um, to avoid infringement. That sounds um, mm -hmm. simple, but it isn't, because it has been ruled several times that a mere carve-out um, in the label is not enough. And like in Germany, it's now sort of trying to find out what the generic should do in order to um, to escape um, infringement. Indirect infringement um, is accepted in the Netherlands, um, and that has probably to do with the fact that this type claims are treated in the same way as EPC 2000 claims. That is which means that the purpose of um, of the pharmaceutical can be given to the certain pharmaceutical later um, down the line. For example, by a pharmacist uh, putting on a label um, of the specific pharmaceutical. Um, so that is um, that's probably also uh, different uh, than the UK. Um, that all being said. Um, the Netherlands Supreme Court and the lower courts uh, usually look quite carefully of what happens in both Germany and the UK. So it could very well be that in the Netherlands we will also move towards the UK approach in the future. But that, of course, um, remains to be seen. I would like now to close the um, information discussion and hand over to um, my colleague uh, Paul England to touch upon plausibility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. 
So let's uh, at this point then turn from infringement and look at the plausibility part of the Warner-Lambert Supreme Court decision. In order to understand this part of the Supreme Court's decision, it's necessary, I think, to examine more closely first the types of pain that were at issue in the Warner-Lambert case. So I'll just say something about those now. First, there's nociceptive pain. This is produced by noxious external stimuli, such as heat, extreme cold, intense mechanical pressure, or chemicals. And these stimulate fibers known as nociceptors, which transmit impulses via the spinal cord to the brain, where they're perceived as pain. This type of pain results with treatment of the underlying cause. A particular type of nociceptive pain relevant here is inflammatory pain. This is where the body responds to an injury by releasing chemical mediators, which increase the sensitivity of nociceptors, causing, both, uh, causing pain both at the site of the injury or in the surrounding area. Like other nociceptive pain, inflammatory pain resolves uh, with the treatment of the underlying cause. Then there is neuropathic pain, which of course features in claim three here, which unlike nociceptive and inflammatory pain, uh, this is pathological, being caused by damage to the nervous system itself. This means it is pain initiated or caused by a primary lesion or dysfunction of the nervous system. Also, unlike nociceptive inflammatory pain, neuropathic pain can last for years or even for life. But note that there are two types of neuro neuropathic pain, which I've already mentioned in the context of construction earlier. And these are peripheral neuropathic pain, which arises from damage or dysfunction of the peripheral nervous system. And there's also central neuropathic pain, uh, which is rarer and arises from damage or dysfunction of the central nervous system. In claim three, as we saw, um, the court judged to cover both. Uh, then the terms allodynia and hyperalgesia also feature to a lesser extent in this case, allodynia being pain experienced in response to a stimulus that would uh, not normally be expected to cause pain, and hyperalgesia is an increased response to a thermal or mechanical stimulus that one would normally expect to be less painful. With that short introduction, let me turn to the plausibil plausibility issue in full. And let's address why uh, there's a plausibility test to begin with. Plausibility's origin under English law is not in fact from the UK courts, but instead the Technical Boards of Appeal Authority of Agrevo, Trizol Sulfonamides, and the later Johns Hopkins case. These establish um, at the EPO that to be patentable, claims must make a technical contribution which is at least plausible. Now, those cases I've just named concerned inventive step under Article 56 of the European Patent Convention. But the requirement to provide a plausible technical contribution has since been described by the UK courts essentially as a baseline or threshold test of patentability in English patent law, which pervades now inventive step, novelty, priority, and sufficiency. Nonetheless, the courts have been careful to emphasize that plausibility is not a standalone ground of validity and that it has to be treated in the context of the statutory obligations. But even so, it's recognized by the UK courts that plausibility serves a particular purpose that existing approaches to the statutory objections don't. In particular, in the context of second medical use claims, there has to be a balance between, on the one hand, a demand that the patent specification contains the results of a clinical trial in order to prove efficacy, and on the other hand, the argument that if all the patent contains is a mere proposal, then it has not made a contribution to the art at all. The problem with the first proposition is that although the existence of patent 
may drive investment in a clinical trial which might not otherwise take place. This means the patent must be applied for before the results of the cl uh, clinical trials are known. The problem with the second proposition is that it would be a recipe for abuse if all that was required in order to obtain a patent in the field in question was a proposal without any basis. So the plausibility concept really reflects the practical difficulty of demonstrating therapeutic efficacy to any higher standard at the stage when the patent application must in practice be made. Now the question that almost immediately follows from that is um, how high is the plausibility threshold, threshold? How much information is required in the patent for it to be plausible? Uh, the Court of Appeal in Warner-Lambert had thought that the threshold was not only low, but that the test could be satisfied by a prediction based on the slimmest of evidence, or one based on material which was manifestly incomplete. But Lord Sumption in the Supreme Court disagrees with this. The test is relatively undemanding, but it cannot be deprived of all meaning, Sumption says or reduced to little more than a test of good faith, as he thinks uh, the Court of Appeal does. Lord Sumption thinks instead that if the threshold were as low as suggested by the Court of Appeal, it would be unlikely to serve even the limited purpose of barring speculative or uh, what are often called armchair claims. So let's see how Lord Sumption, leading the majority decision in the Supreme Court, approaches this question in more detail, and for that I'm going to hand back to Matt again. Matt. Uh, <coughs> thanks, Paul. Um, so, Lord Sumption explains uh, that plausibility is inevitably influenced by the legal context. But in the present case, he makes a number, he, he makes a number of points of guidance as to how to apply this. First, uh, the proposition that a product is efficacious for the treatment of a given condition must be plausible. Second, it is not made plausible by a bare assertion to that effect, and disclosure of a mere possibility that it will work is no better than a bare assertion. But third, the claim therapeutic effect may well be rendered plausible by a specification showing that something was worth trying for a reason. In other words, because reasonable scientific grounds are disclosed for expecting that it might well work. The disclosure of those grounds marks the difference between a speculation and a contribution to the art. Fourth, although the patent needn't prove the assertion that the product works for the claimed purpose, there must be something that causes the skilled person to think there is a reasonable prospect that the assertion will prove to be true. Fifth, that reasonable prospect must be based on, uh, and, and I quote from uh, Salk, this is as, as Lord Sumption does, a direct effect on a met metabolic mechanism specifically involved in the disease, this mechanism being either known from the prior art or demonstrated in the patent per se. Now, I, I pause here to note that this particular point of guidance was the thing that the minority judgments from uh, Lord Hodge and Lord Mance expressly take issue with as potentially giving rise to the need to have a prima facie case uh, for um, e efficacy set out in the patent. However, in his sixth reason, Lord Sumption addresses this to some extent by making it clear that the effect on the disease process need not necessarily be demonstrated by experimental data it can be demonstrated by a priori reasoning. Finally, Lord Sumption says that sufficiency is a characteristic of the disclosure. Although the disclosure of the specification may be supplemented and explained by the common general knowledge of that skilled person, it is the disclosure that is key. Lord Sumption then looks at what had been established by the judge at first instance about the empirical data disclosed in the patent in support of the claims to neuropathic pain. And so turning to that, 
um, the empirical data from the patent consisted of references to a number of preclinical animal models used to test drugs for various kinds of pain. The most significant of these animal models was the rat poor formalin test. This involves the injection of a noxious agent, formalin, uh, into a rat's paw. The rat is monitored for how long it spends licking or biting its paw. One phase, the second phase of this period, models inflammatory pain. The patent records that the test results showed pregabalin to be, infected, to be effective in this phase, and it is stated in the patent that it is effective to treat inflammatory pain. Next is the carrageenan test, which also models inflammatory pain. Carrageenan is an inflammatory agent, and it is injected into the sole of a rat's paw, and tests are carried out to determine the extent of thermal or mechanical hyperalgesia, which, as Paul explained, is the increased sensitivity to pain. The patent specification again records that the test results showed pregabalin to be effective in treating this inflammatory pain. The post-operative pain model tests for pain responses following surgery. This is referred to in the patent as testing nociceptive responses. Uh, like other tests, nothing in the literature suggests that this model could be used to predict efficacy for neuropathic pain. And whilst the patent specification does refer to two well-known models for peripheral neuropathy, uh, the Bennett model and the Kim and Chung model, no data are presented for either of these models. It followed that the experimental data in the specification was predictive of efficacy against inflammatory pain. But in short, there was no experimental data to make it plausible that pregabalin is effective for the treatment of uh, neuropathic pain. The specification might have supported Claim 3 if it had suggested to the skilled person that there was some unifying principle which made it plausible that pregabalin would work with neuropathic pain. But as the judge held in the context of obviousness, the skilled person would not have considered there was any reasonable basis for thinking that an anticonvulsant like pregabalin, known to be effective for the treatment of epilepsy, would, for that reason alone, be effective in treating neuropathic pain. Warner Lambert had argued that the relevant unifying principle was central sensitization. Uh, this was a well-known concept at the priority date. However, and importantly for this case, whilst the experts were agreed that central sensitization was common to inflammatory pain and peripheral neuropathic pain, it was not known to be causative of either. There was also no necessary correlation between uh, allodynia and secondary hyperalgesia on the one hand, and either central sensitization or neuropathic pain on the other. Seemingly unanimously, uh, because the dissenting judges do not address it at all, the Supreme Court therefore uphold the judges' reasons for rejecting Warner Lambert's argument about central sensitization being a uni unifying principle behind inflammatory pain and central neuropathic pain. However, the majority of the Supreme Court go a step further by upholding activists and Mylan's cross-appeal. Whereas the first and second instance had found efficacy against central neuropathic pain not to be plausible, they had held that it was plausible against peripheral neuropathic pain. The cross-appeal submitted that the disclosure of the patent was not capable of justifying a claim to a monopoly of the manufacturer of pregabalin for the treatment of neuropathic pain of any kind. So moving to the cross-appeal cross in, in more detail, the, the, this was allowed because, as discussed, the only evidence of therapeutic efficacy presented in the specification are the results of animal models, and those results were predictive only of efficacy for inflammatory pain. Lord Sumption comments that the first instance judge's analysis of the implications for peripheral neuropathic pain of the data presented in the specification was based entirely on the common general knowledge that sensitization, central sensitization, was involved in both inflammatory and peripheral neuropathic pain. The judge concluded from this that it was possible 
that a drug with the specification, with which the specification is shown to be effective for the first, would also be effective for the second. Although, as he admitted, this would not necessarily be the case. Lord Sumption says that this is a logical non sequitur. The reason for seeking a unifying principle embracing neuropathic as well as inflammatory pain is that the unifying principle may suggest a common cause or metabolic mechanism embracing both, whose operation may be affected by the drug. That might in turn suggest that a drug which was effective for one condition might also be effective for the other. But neither the specification nor the common general knowledge supplied any reason for supposing this. In particular, there was nothing to suggest, even as a hypothesis, that pregabalin works with peripheral neuropathic pain by blocking central sensitization. There was also simply an absence of any evidence that pregabalin acted on central sensitization at all. Furthermore, it was not, in the majority view, enough to justify a monopoly that it was possible a priori that a drug which was effective for inflammatory pain would also be effective for neuropathic pain, without any reason to suppose that the possibility had some scientific basis or that it was more than speculative. As Lord Sumption puts it in his judgment, everything is possible that is not impossible, but not impossible is very far from being an acceptable test for sufficiency. Plausibility may be easy to demonstrate, but it calls for more than that. So what uh, does Warner-Lambert change? What can we conclude from the Supreme Court's decision? As regards plausibility, there is a debate about whether the EPO case law says that plausibility only needs to be demonstrated if the therapeutic effect in the second medical use pattern is inherently implausible. The majority of the Supreme Court think not. Lord Sumption, for the majority, says if this were correct, then it would mean that if nothing was known either for or against the claimed therapeutic effect, no disclosure may be needed in support of it. This, as he says, would be an odd result and contrary to the policy considerations we have described. Instead, the majority adopts a positive requirement for plausibility, and the, their concern seems to be that the Court of Appeal, in this case, set the bar too low by effectively suggesting that plausibility is little more than a test of good faith. Instead, there must be reasonable scientific grounds disclosed for expecting that the invention might well work. To put this another way, there must be something that causes the skilled person to think that there is a reasonable prospect that the assertion will prove to be true, in the sense that plausibility must be based on either some predictive data or some a priori reasoning. Lord Sumption also says a reasonable prospect must be based on a direct effect of a metabolic mechanism specifically involved in the disease. This mechanism being either known from the prior art or demonstrated in the patent per se. It's worth pointing out, however, that the minority judges, Lords Mance and Hodge, think that this is putting the test too high. It risks, in their judgment, involving a requirement to establish a prima facie case on the material in the specification. This is not, in their view, supported by the EPO authorities. Another issue raised by this discussion, given that the decision is focused on second medical use claims, is whether the plausibility bar now set is the same for other forms of claim, in particular for per se claims. We know from earlier English authorities that plausibility applies to those claims too. But the difference with a per se claim is there must simply be a plausible technical effect or contribution of some kind, of any kind, rather than for a specific treatment of a condition. Given the generality of a per se claim, is there the same need to disclose material amounting to a reasonable prospect that such an effect is true? This issue is, is likely to come up again quite quickly and we will watch out for further developments. Where the decision of the Supreme Court is perhaps more radical is the test set for infringement of second medical use claims. 
uh, which, as we've heard from uh, Gisbert and Judith, is now very different to the approach taken in Germany and the Netherlands. The Court of Appeal foreseeability test is gone, together with the defence of taking all reasonable steps. In its place are two possibilities, each representing the reasoning of two Supreme Court justices. First, the outward presentation test, and second, the subjective intention test. This appears to be confusing, and which, which test is the right one? However, they are not actually mutually exclusive. As Lord Briggs states, the outward presentation to the market of a product will often, or indeed usually, be decisive evidence, one way or the other, of the manufacturer's intended purpose. In other words, the subjective intention test incorporates, but is not limited to, the product's outward presentation. The same is true of Lord Mance's test. Lord Briggs would also include evidence of the smoking gun documents and marketing activity in this test. Therefore, even though the decision on direct infringement is over to, it will be very influential on lower courts. And those generic companies wishing to avoid allegations of, second medical, of infringement of second medical use patents to certain indications will be well advised to note all these factors. Hmm. What they do not need to do anymore, it seems, is write letters to doctors and pharmacists' organisations to head off the foreseeability test. One issue remains unanswered from this decision, however. Uh, the case is concerning Swiss form claims. But second medical use claims dating from December 2007 and after have to use the EPC 2000 claim form, X for use in treating Y. These are product claims rather than process claims. And so would that change the analysis of the Supreme Court? The emphasis of the court's decision on direct infringement was on the word for and the practical implications of the tests that use intention as a touchstone of direct infringement. It seems to us that for direct, for direct infringement, these factors are not altered by the EPC 2000 claim form. And that the Supreme Court judges would likely come to the same conclusions if faced with an EPC 2000 claim. Perhaps the court will one day have to return to this issue in this context, but that is, I'm afraid, for a future webinar. And that brings us to the end of today's webinar. Thank you all for attending. Um, please look out for further articles that we intend to publish on Synapse um, that will address different issues and different aspects of this decision. And also, please provide feedback um, on the form that's about to pop up on your browser. Thank you very much.